I am now very pleased to announce the third Ed Talk of our National Forum. Joining us next is Freeman Rabowski, President of the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. His research and publications focus on science and math education with a focus on minority participation and performance. This year, 2014, marks the 60th anniversary of the Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education decision and the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Having been raised myself and working near the Topeka High School in that case, I have had the honor of learning much about this historic decision and am excited to have a national leader such as Dr. Rabowski here to share his experiences with us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rabowski as he shares his thoughts on the struggle for high quality education for all children. Good afternoon. I am told that I am somehow competing with the World Cup. I can't do that. But what I can do is talk about us as America for the next few minutes. And I'm going to flip the classroom. How many of you know what it means to flip the classroom? Good, good, good. I start with a story from Birmingham. I am president of a university in Baltimore, UMBC, a place that has students from 150 countries. And it's a fascinating place. I could never have imagined as a child growing up in Birmingham that I would be around kids from 150 countries. I grew up in uh, the Deep South. I call Baltimore the, the Upper South. <laughs> One day we're like Philadelphia, the next day we're like Richmond. It depends on the issue. But Birmingham is the Deep South, as you know. And I was sitting in church in the middle of the week, and my parents had made it clear I needed to hear somebody talk. And the man said, we want the children to participate in this peaceful demonstration to let America know that even our babies know the difference between right and wrong, and they want a good education. And I looked up, and I said, who is that guy? And they said his name was Dr. King. Now, I was sitting in the back of the church doing the two things I like most, doing my math. I always got goosebumps doing math, and eating my M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. And all of a sudden, I said, I'll do that. I got home and I said to my parents, I want to go. And they said, absolutely not. And I said, you guys are hypocrites. You make me go. You listen, I can listen to this guy. I do. He tells me he wants us to go and participate, and you won't let me go. They said, because you probably would have to go to jail. And I said, well, I'll do it. And they finally let me go. I did go. It was a week, a terrible week. But it taught me one very important lesson that I use as an educator today. And the lesson was this, even children can be taught to be empowered to believe in themselves and to understand that there's no time to be a victim, that what matters is that they have that sense of self, number one, and number two, that they do the best that they can. Give me a hand for the idea of a sense of self for children. It's so important. It's so important. You know, all of you in this room can think back to a time when the world was different. Now, I'm flipping the class because I'm going to ask you questions. What percent of Americans do you think in the 1950s or 60s had a high school diploma? What do you think? Well, if we break it down by race, and at that time they were talking black, white, it was about 50% of whites, about 30-some percent of blacks. That was it. Quite frankly, I remember my parents were educators. My dad had left teaching to work in the steel mill because you could make more money, but he loved education so much, he was working to prepare kids, I mean young men, to get their GED, and my mother would teach them at night. And what was important was reading and mathematics, and because the whole the deal at the time was get a high school diploma because it could help you to be better than you are. This was in the 50s and the 60s. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you in this room were in the world by 1960. Let me see your hands. OK, all right, all right. Um, how many of you remember something, even though you may not have been born, called the GI Bill? In, in 1944, this GI Bill came along. And what was amazing was, for the first time, we talked about veterans going to college. Do you know the one group that was against the idea of veterans going to college? What group do you think it was? College presidents. 
College presidents from the University of Chicago all the way to Harvard said, nope, if we let the veterans into our colleges, they will become academic hobo jungles. That was the language. It wasn't that they were against veterans, they just thought it was not the thing to do. Now, why do I tell you that? These were wonderful people. They just couldn't see a world where veterans, ordinary Americans, as they were thought of as being, could make it in college. And yet, within a year or two, millions of Americans Men mainly, mainly white, but ordinary Americans went to college and made it. Why do I tell you that story? It set the tone for the idea of regular people going to college. And then in the 60s, when we had this march in Birmingham and some other things happened, and the march on Washington, and all of a sudden, and you had this legislation called civil rights, and President Kennedy, and it wasn't going away, and then a southerner, President Johnson, who knew so many people, who knew Washington, who was master of the Senate, and before you knew it, on July 2nd, tomorrow, this language, this legislation was passed. And I want you to know, when I went into the bathroom today, when I went into the bathroom today, I thought about my father and my mother and me, and I thought to myself, 50 years ago, I could not have walked into this hotel. And I thought to myself, America, is a different place today from 50 years ago. Give our country a hand for being a different place. A different place. 50 years ago, I've got a colleague somewhere here who is the speaker pro tem in my country, a black, in my state, a black woman who could not have been the speaker pro tem in Maryland. Wherever she is, give Adrian Jones a hand for being the speaker pro tem. All of you. So many of you in this room could not have been who you are. And I start with this notion that the way we think about ourselves as a country, the language that we use, the way we talk to each other, the way we listen or don't listen to each other will shape who we are. And so we were a country at that time where most people of all races, quite frankly, didn't even have a high school diploma. In fact, in the 50s, only about 5% of Americans had a high school degree. And then, I mean, a college degree, excuse me, with about half of whites and 30-some percent of, of blacks. And then, amazingly, and about 25% of Hispanics and a, a smaller percentage of Native Americans. And now, what has happened? What happened was with those veterans, all of a sudden, with, with, when you talk about the, the legislation of the federal government, all of a sudden, we saw the Higher Education Act and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the idea of more opportunities for people underprivileged, blacks, minorities, but people from low-income backgrounds in general, getting a stronger education. And before we knew it, we had millions of Americans going to college. And so by 1970, we had finally gotten up to 11% of Americans with a college degree. And between 1970 and 1990, we actually got up to 21% of Americans with a college degree. How many of you in this room are between 35 years old and 70 years old? I got good news and bad news. Which one you want first? <laughs> bad news is you're getting old. Get over it. It's OK. I'm over 60. It's OK. It beats the alternative. Am I right? The good news, though, is you're the best educated in the world. If you're an American and you're in that age range, you're the best educated in the world. Only Norway, slightly better educated than we are. All right? Anybody between 25 and 34? I see a few hands. They're very proud. Look at them. They're looking so proud. Look. They said, we're not old like you all. I got good news and bad. Which one you want first? Bad news is you're not as smart as we are. <laughs> but the good news is we wish we were your age, so enjoy being your <laughs> You're down to number 12. You're down to number 12. Why? Because other countries are investing more than we are. And they are, we have not moved backwards. We're just not moving forward, you see. We have about the same percentage going to college as we had before and about the same percentage graduating. The big challenge that we face, we now have many more people with a college degree. If you ask the question, what's happened since the Civil Rights Act, yeah, people can go into hotels. They can use the restrooms. We've got more happening in terms of, of the voting rights. We've got to still keep working on those kinds of issues. But we have people in school now, many more people finishing high school. Question of when they finish high school, can they read well? There is the question, right? Can they compute well? But you now can say, we can say 80-some percent of blacks and whites both finish high school. We have, depending on the group of Hispanics, uh, if it's the Cuban population, they're at 80-some percent. 
The Puerto Rican population is 70 some percent. The Mexican American is still only 50 some percent. So you've got to break it down by groups. But you've got some groups where you only have only slightly over half still with a high school diploma. So it depends on the group you're working with. And the real challenge is for those who drop out, whether it's Hispanic, where you're talking about literally 30 some percent dropping out, or in blacks, almost 20 percent, large percentages since the 70s who are becoming incarcerated. In fact, if you are a high school graduate and you are male, because of the new policies, public policy policies, since the 70s, we've gone from 2,000 prisoners in our country all the way to 2.2 million prisoners in our country with questions about whether it's really made a difference in crime. And yet, what we see is if you're white and a high school dropout, the probability of going to prison is 0.2, 20%. If you are Hispanic, it's 0.28, 28%. If you're black, it's 70%, 0.70. So one of the points is that somehow we must keep children in school. Just keeping them in school. For, give me a hand for keeping children in school. <laughs> for the moral reason, for the academic, even for the financial reason. Think of what it costs to keep people in prison. So for all those reasons, just in terms of public policy, and then on the other side, in terms of college, here's the challenge. Yeah, every program talks about sending people to college, but the real issue is this. They go to college, but they don't graduate. This is the issue that we face. If you've not read Degrees of Inequality by Mettler at Cornell, you must read it. It's saying that because of several major public policies, it's becoming more and more difficult for low-income people of any race to graduate from college. They can get in, but they do not graduate. And it has to do with the academic reasons, reading and math skills, yes, but the other issues too. And that is the, the issue about Pell Grants. In the 80s, in the 70s to 90s, America made the most progress it had ever made in moving people out of poverty. You know, when we talk about this Civil Rights Act, we talk about it helping blacks and Hispanics and women. I'll never forget, I was speaking in Georgia, to a school board, and a, a, a guy got up and said, Dr. Bowski, let me tell my story. He said, I'm CEO of a company. I'm head of the school board. I'm very blessed. He said, everybody expects, assumes I came from money. He said, my father had died. My mother was a sharecropper. But she saw the little Negro children going to college in the late 60s. And she said, I want that for my children, but I don't have any money. And the counselor said, you can get some financial aid for your children. We got the financial aid. I got to college. My sister got to college. We moved my mother out of poverty. And now here I am, a wealthy guy. I am white. I am male. And I profited from the Civil Rights Act, as did Americans. Give that act one more round of applause, because a lot of people profited from that act. Now, let me ask you, how many of you in this room are either the first in your family or the first generation to go to college? Let me see your hands. Now, there is the, the progress of America. And this is the challenge that we face, that if we are to be globally competitive, we must find a way to help many more people not only go to college, but succeed. Because the challenge is, if you're from a high-income family, the probability of going and graduating is 0.8. But if you are from the low income of any race, the probability is only 20%. And that has to do with the, the academic skills, but it also has to do with the fact that in the 70s and 80s, Pell Grant paid 30% of the bill to, I mean, 80% of the bill. Today, they paid 30% of the bill. And it has to do with the fact that states have invested less in higher education. One of the really positive statements about my own state of Maryland, and I can truthfully say this, is that the legislature, the governor, the elected officials, the public, really, they see the future of our state as being directly tied to the quality of K-12 and higher education. So we are investing in education because we know knowledge is power. And the future of our country will be tied to our ability to take our children of all types and to help them to want to be smart. So what has the Civil Rights Act done? What have we done as a nation? We have shown that if you give a chance a child to love to read, and think, and to become like me, somebody who loves math. And if you tell that child, you can take ownership of your education, you can say to the world, no time to be a victim, that you can say, 
You can do anything. You can be president of a university if you just do your best. You work hard and you give it all you have. That is the value of America, that all things are possible if you just have that support. I would argue to this group of public policy people that we look at ways of connecting universities and K through 12, and that we say to our children that this is a great country, that our history is one of human beings who've made mistakes, but who's, who have done, we've done so many things well, that we've produced children who have become leaders who are making a difference in the world, and that at the core of our success, has been our education. We must be passionate about our education for all of our children. Our very future depends on it. I challenge you, America, to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. God bless America. Thank you all. Thank you.